So hello everyone, very warm welcome from Vienna. This is Euro Also brand new webinar series. That's the third edition. And we are very happy to have Lars Mikkel Broman from Stockholm and Karolinska, Sweden today with us. As all of you know, they have extensive, uh, extensive experience in, in all sorts of ECMO related issues. And we are very happy to hear about uh, interhospital transports on extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. Mick, thank you so much for making yourself available today for us, and we are very much looking forward to your presentation. Just one more word to our participants. Uh, you'll have the chance to log in your questions uh, via the, uh, the panel that you have uh, when you joined the webinar. You can just uh, use uh, kind, of, kind of the chat function and send questions to me. I will sort them out and after the presentation of Mick. Um, hand them on to Mick so we can have a nice discussion afterwards. So thank you very much all of you for joining and Mick, this is you. Well, uh, uh, thank you for having me and uh, my name is Michael Broman. I'm a, a, a physician at the ECMO Center Karolinska. Can you see my frames now? I hope. Uh, and I'm going to talk about uh, intrahospital transport and extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. Uh, I've got a few disclosures. I've been on the advisory board for Eurosets and Xenios, and also have, have had some talks for Xenios, uh, or rather Gettinger, Makea, and Evolon Pharma. My disclosures are also to the ELSO, where I'm in the registry committee, and for the Euro ELSO, where I'm in the scientific committee and working group for innovation and technology for ECLS. And I'm also the, the responsible guy for research development, the principal investigator at ECMO Center Kalinska in, in Stockholm. Uh, this talk I've divided into sort of two pieces. The first one is the background to why we should ever have transports and need them. And it concerns the incidence of respiratory, uh, respiratory failure, uh, center size, organization of ECMO services, etc. And then also, and then we turn into transports. Uh, and I will sort of follow some kind of logical time trajectory uh, when the alarm comes, and then transport modes, team composition, assessment, cannulation, complications, training, uh, and then there are two slides for your eyes concerning a few references. Well, this is the ECMO community as of July this summer, where you can see that the ECMO centers are spread all around the world. And that's a tremendous increase when, when comparing just a, a decade ago. Uh, this slide shows that uh, currently there's almost 400 member centers around the world. And uh, we have more than 100,000 registered ECMO runs in the ELSO registry. This slide shows the fractional uh, proportions of, uh, of uh, neonatal to, to adult ECMOs over the last almost two decades, from 1990 to 2017. And what you can see is that this blue fraction, that's neonatal pulmonary or respiratory, has decreased, at least in fraction. Uh, whereas uh, adult respiratory and adult cardiac has increased tremendously uh, over the last 10 years. In fact, uh, both pediatric and neonatal are quite stable to the absolute numbers. Neonatal may be a, a slight declining trend, so it's all about the increase in uh, respiratory and, and cardiac adult ECMO. And this slide shows uh, the numbers reported to the registry uh, since 1990, and what you can see is that something happened like 2009, uh, and actually it was not just the H1N1 pandemic, it was also the publication of the CISER study, and then that we enter the ECMO2 era, that is when we got more uh, equipment that were more easily run and also uh, better cannula, et cetera, with, for biocompatibility and so forth. Uh, up to this point, uh, less than even 10 centers performed ECMO transports worldwide, and up to the H1N1 pandemic, more than every tenth of adult ECMO runs, they were actually performed in Stockholm, and that was concerning the adults, which at that point was quite controversial. It's hard to 
look for incidences for ARDS. Um, when you look through literature, I did this during the spring. Uh, it seems like the, the incidence in Australia and New Zealand is like 28 per 100,000 per year. In Spain, it's, it's been reported to be 7.2. And when I myself checked the Swedish intensive care registry, it would be like seven patients per 100,000 per year. Uh, data from the U.S., several papers, and the, the range is quite wide, but I guess an average would, would be like 12 to, to 15 per 100,000 per year. So there's some discrepancy in definitions, although it should be according to the Berlin uh, criteria. Uh, but anyway, uh, then we have a lung safe study or the lung safe study group that, that uh, in the first publication, uh, came out uh, from that we can read that of the patients that were addressed to a group of severe ARDS, 2% of those required or, or were supported with ECMO. And in the moderate ARDS group, it was 1.1%. But from that data, you cannot calculate the incidences uh, due to the design of the study. If we go to the incidence of ECMO requiring acute respiratory failure in the adults, the global estimation, mostly from the discussions and background of the position paper by Combs and colleagues, uh, gave a figure of 0.5 to 1 per 100,000 per year. Data from France indicate 1 per 100,000 uh, and Sweden 0.34. And that's data I've retrieved from the Swedish Intensive Care Registry and from our own uh, numbers uh, over several years. In Germany, you can see the figure is about 2.5, and that's a bit higher. And the discrepancy between centers here, although it's in the Western world and Northern Europe, it's about yeah, different things influence what we do and reimbursements and indications and who, who performs the ECMO runs, et cetera, et cetera. But that's another discussion. Concerning uh, volumes, this paper came out by Barbara Dahl uh, 2015, and what they looked to was uh, if center, center volume uh, had an influence on, on outcome, and it was data from the ELSO registry, 56,000 patients. Uh, in the same uh, issue of the Blue Journal, uh, an editorial was written by Eddie Fan and Danny Brody, and they also commented in a quite uh, interesting discussion that not only the, the number per, per year matters, but probably the total time you run your ECMO. So, so uh, that might be something to look into, but, but there's no studies on that yet. And concerning uh, the neonatal and pediatric population, two studies were already at hand that gave quite strong indications for how many patients you should run to perform better than low, low uh, volume centers. And we will soon come to that. Uh, this slide shows results from the Barber study that the uh, as a registry 56,000 patient study. And what you can see here is that uh, in neonates and adults from 1989 to 2013, there's a, a correlation between uh, numbers run per year and the uh, odds ratio for in-hospital mortality. Uh, when going for the ECMO 2 era or after 2008, that signal was still or even enhanced maybe in the adult population, though it sort of faded away in the pediatric and neonatal populations, probably due to that low volume centers run uh, less sick patients, uh, and that will lead to dilution of, of the, the signal in, in such a type of study. Um, well, that was registered studies. If we look to what we have in, in Sweden from real life, I took this data from the Swedish Intensive Care Registry, and that's a totally open registry where you can go in yourself and uh, search and uh, play around. And uh, this slide shows all the respiratory and, and uh, cardiac ECMOs performed in Sweden bef between January 2013 and 2018. And during that period, all these centers did report in. Uh, however, there's three other uh, ECMO providing centers in Sweden that did not report during this period at all. And uh, the data here shows that 
during five years, the average for our unit was 80 runs per year. And then the three participating, so to say, low volume centers that had an average between five and 10 runs per year. Does this have any effect on the outcome? Uh, this is SMRs, uh, and the, the SMR is recalibrated for Swedish population, uh, and then uh, uh, the outcome in Sweden is like almost 20% better. That means that the red dots here is the SMR uh, calculated for, for the Swedish calibrated SMRs, but if you're international, that will be down here, the black dot. Uh, and there is a difference if you see the confidence interval between a high volume center and one of the small volume centers. The other two here, they had too, le, le, too few patients to make any statistics. This is a VLAD curve and it's based on the Swedish calibration of SAPS3. And uh, it actually describes how many lost or won lives you have over a time period. A patient that survives will have a positive delta up on the curve and a, a patient that diseases will make the curve go down. And then if you have a high estimated risk for mortality and you survive, then the delta up will be more than if the risk for mortality was less. And over time, you can see that the, the combined statistics for the low volume centers will over five years uh, lose 24 lives. If we see the curve for a high volume unit, then you can see here that, that uh, the trend is directly opposite. And we can see the same for children and neonates, also from the Swedish Intensive Care Registry, where you have the high volume center curve here uh, and the ECMO runs reported into registry at least, or very few during this time, uh, and seems like that they are doing around zero or, or maybe a, a slight negative trend. It's a signal, but it's not the truth. And you can do the same for septic shock, ARDS, et cetera. And it seems like the, the higher volume centers do better, but there's so few observations. So it's really hard to tell what, what's behind this. this. But uh, the more you do, the outcome will probably be better. And uh, looking for over these five years, you see 98 treatments, uh, septic shock, Six, uh, I can't see if that's something in my screen here, but uh, it's like uh, 26 lives uh, plus. Uh, so what's, what do we know about center volume for respiratory ECMO? That's a recommendation that came out uh, four years ago from, from the ECMO net, et cetera. It was a position paper by uh, Combs and Brody and, and colleagues. And uh, already from the studies I showed you the references for by Freeman and Karamalu, uh, we knew that at least 20 annual ECMO runs are required to build and maintain competence and skills uh, for, for staff. And uh, combining these studies and the Barbaro study, we could say today that at least 12 to 15 annual respiratory runs are required for a good outcome uh, uh, compared to low volume centers, still defined as zero to five uh, treatments per year. And that center should also fulfill the 20 minimum of the total ECMO runs. And then the Freeman Karamlu, that they had shown that 20 to 10, 22 annual ECMO runs were necessary in, in children and units to increase uh, survival uh, in, compared to low volume centers. I've got a problem, so. Okay, how should ECMO be organized? Well, it's suggested that you should uh, sort of centralize or consolidate adult respiratory ECMO at least to high volume center that supports a population of five to 15 million. You should create national regional networks for uh, of units with skilled staff for cannulation that will have the ability to manage respiratory ECMO till a mobile team could come and retrieve the patient to the high volume center in the middle. Uh, in times of pandem pandemics, et cetera, you, you should consolidate the most sick patients in these hubs. And then uh, in lack of beds, you, you, you uh, transfer patients that are less sick 
LASIK out in the spokes to, to the sort of supporting centers in the network. And then when there's bed, there's bed again in the hub, then you can take the patients back. And of course, you can have communication between hubs in different regions and even uh, over national borders. Uh, if you organize in such way, you will provide the most safe and efficient care to the population and you also optimize cost and resources spent will and will increase survival rate and, and also decrease morbidity in these populations. But of course, now we come to, to transports and, and it, this calls for a mobile ECMO service that's active 24 seven. Now I'm gonna give you a slide uh, where which shows some demographics. This is the new Karinsk hospital with a helicopter hovering above and uh, enjoy this because that's the most expensive building on this planet this far. Uh, concerning the Karolinska uh, Respiratory ECMO Center since 1997, one of the first uh, established in Europe. It's a pure ECMO ICU and we uh, have done more than 1300 runs and we close to uh, 1300 patient treatments. Uh, today, all ages are treated and uh, about 50% are adults that will belong to the pediatric intensive care uh, sort of uh, uh, department. We do not do post cardiotomies, but all other ECMOs, even, uh, even uh, in the cardiac definition like, like myocarditis, is ECPRs, uh, lung pulmonary embolism, etc. And currently, we have about 90 annual runs in the ICU, 60% of those are VAs. And in our organization, we have no perfusionists. The transport organization was set 1995, and the first transport work was in 96. And today we perform about 90 annual transports, both national and international. 60% uh, are by aircraft, and about 88% to 90 is uh, or primary, that means that we assess the patient bedside wherever that is, and then the patient is cannulated, stabilized for a few hours, and then the ECMO transport uh, is commenced. And we might take the patient to Stockholm or elsewhere. This slide shows uh, data from a clinical database where we have uh, this far almost nine, 990 the transports performed on ECMO, most of those are primary, where well, the majority ended up in Stockholm, but some uh, were transported elsewhere to another ECMO center. Uh, could be due to that the mission was from start set to put the patient on at A and please take it to, to C. So we were more like the transmitter of the service. Uh, and some we had to, to transport elsewhere because we had no beds in Stockholm. We also performed uh, a little over 100 secondary transports. That means that the patient is already on ECMO when we come. It could have been on for, for a day. It could have been on for, for weeks or, or, or even months. Uh, such transfer are in most cases due to a medical indication but it could also be lack of beds, say that we, we take back a patient to Stockholm that we had to, to put some somewhere else directly after ECMO was commenced. Of course, not all launches leads to uh, an actual ECMO transport. Sometimes the patient improves. Sometimes the patient has died. Meanwhile, we were on the way out to, to the uh, hospital where the patient was. And uh, it also happens that after ECMO started, we go for a CT scan and it's obvious that this treatment is futile and then we would uh, withdraw from treatment at site. Well, when a phone call comes, often to the ECMO physician on call, the question is said, uh, do you think this is a po potential patient for ECMO? If it's a no, we will, the, the patient is deferred, but we will in many cases have a continued sort of telephone supportive function uh, if it's wished for by the, the uh, referring hospital. We keep track of this quite well. And uh, you can see from this slide that this sort of 
free of cost services, being on call and asking questions has its peak, especially during the flu season. And uh, uh, it takes about a 60% duty to do that if you make an average over the year. Then we have the other patients that are potential for ECMO. Then we start to think, what's about uh, the distance, uh, time frame to act, and what would be the transport mode? Uh, yes, but maybe there's margins. Maybe there's something else you could do at home. Uh, but we would accept the patient if he or she gets worse. And then we stay in a dialogue for half an hour, five hours overnight. And uh, in most cases, actually, the, the patients do approve uh, from tips we give them. But uh, approximately 25% of the calls will end up in an alert when we say, yes, we have to come or, or we can come if you wish us to. Uh, and then I will ask for patient wait so the nurse can mix the heparin and then also uh, order of blood products for blood priming or to have uh, du during the transfer in the health patient. Uh, several, several modes to get out there and get back. In most cases, we, we go out to, to the retrieving hospital by car or by aircraft. But anyway, we have to pack this van to go out to the ambulance aircraft. Uh, in a few cases, we use the military aircraft carrier you can see on the right, the one with propellers, and uh, uh, helicopters will be more usual in the aging times, but, but it might be so in the future. We, we never know. Uh, who goes? In our system, it's the ECMO physician, it's the ECMO specialist, and the cannulating surgeon. Uh, we try to bring a scrub nurse on any or every international transfer because it's quite nice if the surgeon can talk to, to the support he actually has. Uh, in On national uh, retrievals, I would guess that in uh, slightly less than half, uh, we bring the nurse. And I think that the, the uh, referring hospital, that they, they enjoy to work with us during a cannulation, cannulation procedure too. Uh, we're most often on the road within 60 minutes, but it depends on what time of day uh, and weather conditions, if staff has to come in from home, etc. All the equipment is pre-packed uh, and the logistic procedures are very well established. We have our separate routines for, for just civilian patient transport. And if it's military transport, that, then we have to go to separate folders because it's completely different regulations when taking uh, Swedish armed forces home from, from abroad. And then uh, every, I can't see actually what, what's on the screen now, but, but uh, every organization has its own uh, special composition of, of the transfer team, and they also work or act within their own legislations. Uh, but looking to the staff or, or composition of the ECMO teams, uh, this is from a survey, uh, international survey with 16 centers, and the most used profession concerning nurses is the perfusionist, but you can see that the normal ICU nurse and the ECMO specialist, they're, they're quite uh, high in center participating numbers. Uh, concerning physicians, uh, on the surgical side, you have the thoracic surgeon and for intensive care, uh, I would say that in numbers, they are probably equal. Uh, the average number of uh, or a median number of, of uh, uh, staff uh, taking part is about four. Uh, to the, the ones of you that's been very observative, this slide shows one center that actually has no physicians at all. And that is a, a private company in the US and they transfer patients uh, in between different centers, uh, and uh, those patients are al already on ECMO, of course, but they, uh, the resource that uh, this entity is can also aid in, in the process of, of cannulating the patient, but they have no physicians on, on transport. Pre-packed systems, or, or everything's pre-packed. 
To the right here, you can see surgical equipment, ventilator bag, uh, monitoring bag. Uh, we have cannula, and those you have to pick up and pay, choose the ones, the sizes we, we believe we're going to have to use for that patient's size uh, and given the diagnosis. Uh, circuits are pre-packed pharmaceuticals, we have the ventilators, and then of course we have uh, special racks for transport pump devices. And not to forget telephones, phone numbers, you can get in contact with both your own hospital uh, and uh, to the referring hospital. This equipment is a bit old, the, the slide is a bit old, but uh, uh, we use centrifugals today instead of the roll pump here, but we still have the UPS, that's, that's the uh, uninterruptible power supply that will give us uh, 230 volt AC current in need. So it's sort of for um, uh, rescue and increased safety, although all the equipment today have internal batteries except for, for the uh, blood warmer. Uh, we we'll load everything into one of these uh, vans and then we go either all the way to hospital with the blue lights on or we go to the airport to fly to the closest hospital uh, closest airport to the hospital where the patient is and that would re require transfer of us and the equipment from the airport into the hospital uh, and uh, that will be arranged for by the retrieving hospital uh, Sweden is a quite, I would say, long country from north to south, almost 1,000 miles. 10 million inhabitants, 60% is forest, and uh, most of the population lives in the south and on the east coastline. And actually 15% is above the polar circle. The population is served by eight units for thoracic surgery. And uh, seven of them, that they have uh, the, the resource to perform ECMO. About three to five of these, they, they do maybe zero to three respiratory ECMO runs per year. That, that renders them the uh, epithet uh, low volume centers. Uh, from Stockholm, and now we will be the yellow star on the panel to the left. Uh, we go road if it's up to 300, on occasion 500 kilometers. Uh, it depends on uh, uh, weather conditions, aircraft and airports available, etc. Otherwise, for longer distances, the default would be to, to go in ambulance aircraft. In most cases, this is uh, Cessna Citation too. When we get at site, the patient is always uh, assess bedside, and then the decision, the final decision for commencement or not is uh, is taken. And uh, we look to ventilator settings, including technical dead space. Sometimes we can get rid of quite a, quite a lot of carbon dioxide just to take out the long snorkels people may use sometimes. We look to inotropes, pressors, and the trends of, of the physiology. Echocardiography. Um, is um, advised to use if they say we have one that's one hour old it is one hour old so i would uh, advocate for uh, actually check that out once again and do it yourself if you if you have the skills otherwise uh, ask the referring hospital to 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 get that uh, resource in uh, it's also good to check the vessels for vascular accesses um, how they look and etc and in respiratory ECMO, it's not just VV, it's what the patient needs. So it could be VV, of course, but also VA or in, in certain circumstances, uh, VVA from start. But try to keep it simple and simple is either one dual lumen cannula, cannula or two single lumen cannula. And if it's VA, I should not forget the distal perfusion cannula if it was uh, femoral arterial cannulation. If you're not satisfied with your oxygenation, uh, then after a few hours, then I would seriously uh, discuss to convert to VA ECMO before leaving the hospital, because in the aircraft, it can't be done. So the patient is decided for to be cannulated, and then 
uh, we use uh, this kind of transport pump and sometimes we also or sometimes we use the cardio help and the cardio help is used in uh, transports where uh, the patient is probably going to land at the unit where uh, they use the cardio help or it will be used in secondary transport when the patient's already on ECMO, if it's on ECMO at the Cori Help Center, and the, our mission is to transfer it to a third party, which is a, also a Cori Help Center, of course, we will go with the Cori Help. Uh, if the patient is supposed to end up in Stockholm, it would be probably Cori Help, but we could switch uh, systems uh, at the referring hospital too. We always, always, have the heater, uh, adults or kids. And uh, I will come to, to that soon. After the patient's on, then it's about getting to the hospital or to the, out to the aircraft. And uh, of course, we have to use ambulances where, and adapt to them wherever we are. Uh, if we're in, in the southern part of Sweden, we use the uh, Stockholm County mobile intensive care unit uh, and that's actually bus that's rebuilt as a huge intensive care ambulance uh, and uh, another option would be to, to take uh, an ambulance and put it in into a uh, military aircraft carrier concerning the environment uh, this is good to know, actually, and it has to do with, with the use of heaters and how to, to protect yourself and the patient in a harsh climate. If it's 10 minus centigrade outside, uh, neonate will be hypothermic within five minutes, even though you use the heater on the maximum and you cover the kid as, uh, as good as you can. Uh, just at sub-zero temperatures and a bit wind uh, and moist in the air, IV lines and stopcocks, they, they will freeze in, in 10 to 30 seconds. And that has also occurred in adults. So if, if you do such a uh, loading off from ambulance into aircraft, then you should have a backup plan if, the, if you don't get into the, the second vehicle as fast as you believe you could, then you have to go back inside where you have the heat again. Uh, and then create a new plan. And you always have to have a backup plan. And if you're out on this kind of transport, you should always, always aim to get uh, a hangar uh, that could save the situation and the patient. This is uh, not me. It's, uh, I'm the photograph photographer. Uh, it's a colleague. We are on the secondary transport from uh, abroad, bringing a patient home. And on this transfer, it was just him and I, and you can see that it's quite crowded inside with, with adult patient there to the left. Uh, so you can imagine if you have to switch oxygenator or, or uh, do something major with a cannula, the surgeon has his own role in this transport after commencement. Well, working in these environments and these, these situations, then you have to adapt to, to transport vehicles that you're not accustomed to. And it's advisable to go and check the vehicle before you bring the patient down from the ward. Check the oxygen, where is it? If, if you have to switch tubes, you, will you do that? Or do you ask the, the staff to do it? Power supply, uh, how to load on and then load off. Maybe you have to do some slight sort of rebuild to, to make it work easier or faster or more safe. And you need to know where you could put or store your emergency equipment because you have to bring extra pump console or a hand-driven pump, uh, oxygenators, et cetera, into the patient. You could not have that on a taxi cab or a second ambulance 500 meters in a traffic light behind you. That, that's not feasible and not safe. Uh, you will also have to operate with crews. Uh, ambulance crews, etc., that do not know anything about ECMO or what these transports require. And uh, it's also good to inform the ambulance crew how you want to have it in case of an emergency, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, what I can tell you is on every transport abroad, we bring adapters for, for gas and electricity that's adapted to that country's uh, systems accordingly. 
sometimes you get halfway home and you step off the aircraft, but you won't have an ambulance in hours and hours and hours. And then you have to do, do something to, to get the patient in, improvise. Uh, and uh, of course, we never do that, but, but this is a slide from uh, such a situation. There's a mantra. Every time you move the patient from, from one vehicle to another, from one bed over to the x-ray table, if you're going to do a CT scan, for example, we always check these things out to make that the, the uh, flow is established as before. Uh, electricity is power to, to is power to the units there. Gas to have flow and pressure of the sweep gas is the heater on. Do we have RPMs on the ECMO machine, the pump? Do we have pressure and flow there too? And then what's most easy is just to and always have this as a sort of a reflex. Check the the color of the tubing. Feel the temperature of them. The, the venous drainage tube should be like blueberries, and the arterial tube would have a cherry berry, right red color if everything works out well. But if you're in a transport situation with sort of damp light, they will appear the same. So then you will have to use a flashlight or, or have good monitoring. So be aware of that. Now we will jump more to transportations per se. Uh, more in general, this is a C-17 military aircraft uh, used by the San Antonio uh, facility. And it's huge inside. And then you can imagine that you could transfer several patients and you could bring staff, enormous amounts of staff. Uh, and uh, this slide shows global transport uh, performed by the uh, Wilford Hall, that were neonatal. And now uh, the San Antonio team transports adults more than neonatals because they turn a neonatal system, they close that down. Uh, it's global transport from uh, performed, and they had performed nine of those. And at least on one transport, the staff doing the the transfer were to the number 25, and that's that's a lot of people. Other more long distance transfers transfers that has been performed of uh, by the French that have uh, published eight cases from the French Caribbean over to France. And then there's also one single case uh, from Luxembourg to, to Paris. This slide shows the Stockholm transfers. It's not one transfer, one yellow line. It's more like one yellow line is one uh, transfer corridor. So several transfers may have been in, in the same yellow line, but it illustrates uh, how uh, the, the map looks. Uh, and uh, in this, you can see about 600 transports, of which 560 are fixed wing transports, uh, mostly within Scandinavia, but also abroad. To this, we have all the ground transports that are close to, to 380 by yesterday. And these are the Stockholm transports that are outside of the former map, where the longest one was down to Perth, Australia. Uh, and uh, well, you can do this long distance, but you have to plan for it and you have to be trained uh, by doing the sort of Scandinavian transports in numbers. Uh, this is an illustration of that we don't all, only cover Sweden. We also support Ireland and Finland with respiratory ECMO for neonatals and, and pediatric patients. And when we are out of beds in Stockholm, especially concerning the, the younger persons, we have uh, partners in England and Denmark to whom we turn, and then they could sort of uh, assist us with treating uh, that or those patients for, for a few days or a week, and then we can retreat them back when we have uh, space. Of course, this might be dangerous, uh, and, and shit will happen for sure. And uh, I did this, or we did this uh, investigation a few years back, where we could see that in about 30% of the transport, something happened and the most common complication or adverse events were patient related. Uh, the most common of those was uh, loss of tidal volume and flooding of the lung. And uh, uh, after we've commenced 
we are on ECMO, we re normally reduce the, the uh, ventilator pressures to be gentle to the lungs. And uh, it does happen quite often that, that uh, after uh, an hour or two, we have a lot of plasma in the tube, or we just lose tidal volumes without flooding. Uh, but you have the whole list to the left and right uh, and down. The second most common are uh, equipment technical issues. Clot, oxy, clot in the oxygenator, kind of broken lab devices uh, that uh, uh, ventilator tubes break from temperature. You try to, to uh, stretch them and then they just break because they, they can't withstand low temperatures. Good to know. Uh, but this squared group, vehicle transportation environment issues, they're, they're very hard to, to sort of keep control of. So uh, whatever happens in that square is something you have to adapt to very fast. You, you could train it in simulations and, and stuff, but, but when you're out there, it's a completely different uh, issue. Uh, we did this study a few years back where we categorized in risk categories uh, transfer complications and uh, category one. Uh, that's something you have to attend to within seconds or very fast because it's, it's an Im imminent uh, threat to the patient. Category two, you have a few minutes, but you really have to, to, to make a decision. And then you have a tapering of, of the severity down in category three and four. Uh, severe complications would be defined as category one and two, and those occur in one out of 40 transports. Uh, sorry, category one is about two and a half percent of all transports, and the combined of category one and two that would be the uh, severe complications is like 16 to 18 percent of our transports, and the material is now based on on uh, well over 900 patients, and any adverse event at all will occur in about 25 to 30 percent of your transports when you get up in numbers. That that's probably where you will end up. Um, only six centers this far have published experience from 100 or more ECMO transports. Four centers have published data on adverse events on transports. Uh, and uh, it's sort of like uh, pe people, they do their transports, but they are a bit shy of what actually happens there. Maybe they, they regard it as bad marketing or if it or it may maybe have negative influence of uh, reimbursement. I don't know, but you can see that uh, some report 2% adverse events, and then of course we worse with, with 31. Um, but that, that's just true, but it's also about definition because there are no international definitions. That there's um, not today an active part of the ELSA registry that, 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 con that uh, sort of focuses on ECMO transports, but, but that, that work has started actually. Uh, this is when we looked to severe complications in 908 transports, and in 20% uh, of these, we had a severe complication, and they were associated with, with VA ECMO and also with fixed wing transports. There were no association with uh, time distance or if the transport was international, that is cross the national border, at least one national border. <laughs> uh, then the year before that, we, we published this study concerning any complication and the associations were uh, high risk if the transport time was more than three hours and the fixed wing, if the fixed wing transport was longer than three hours. And then we also saw that fixed wing was a higher risk than ground ambulance. And what's the bigger difference? Probably we have some extra uh, loading offs uh, and reloads when, uh, when we go fixed wing. Um, uh, that might be, but there's also a speculation that we could not see any uh, association to, to distance uh, when we pull that data, and there was uh, no higher risk for VA or VV ECMO in that that study, looking on, on any complication on transports. And uh, today, not published yet, but but it's in submission. Only four deaths have been reported in more than 2,000 international interhospital transports. 
So it seems like complications do occur, but, but the patients, they are stubborn and tend not to die, and not least on, on our shift. Um, if you want to do something good, then you should avoid this default trap. Uh, I know still that some have the oxygenator placed above the patient on the transport rack. If you get a pump stop in VV ECMO, then you will have the hydrostatic pressure from the uh, oxygenator level down to the patient's heart. And uh, that risk to draw sweep gas through the respiratory membrane of the oxygenator into the bloodstream, then you will have gas in your bloodstream. Uh, the same will occur, a risk to occur if you're on VA ECMO and you have an arterial cannula clot and the pump stops. So you're never safe. You have to fix that. Sorry. Well, what? You have to train your team. You should have simulations indoors, outdoors. You could uh, have your ambulance crew and aircraft crew uh, helping you out. Uh, Wet labs, pump training, you could also mimic this in uh, outdoor situations if, if you do it in, in a very tight uh, room, for example. Equipment needs to be approved for transports and equipment may be have to be customized for transports. Not everybody do that, but maybe it's, it's good for how you have your setups and maybe you don't need to do that. You have at least to know your equipment. Uh, it's advised to have timeouts before you dispatch because uh, that double checking will make you realize that you, you almost forgot something that was very important. Don't forget your phones and phone numbers. And then that's always a good personal stuff that, that you could bring with you uh, on a longer transport, especially like, like candy, but also to have tools in your pockets. But remember, if you have knives and stuff, uh, you, you could uh, end up in, in a, a custom thing, even with or without the patient and lose your equipment. Uh, but be prepared for trouble and always have a backup plan. That's very important to have a backup plan. So to conclude, uh, the basics, why we have this, the ECMO resource should be organized in networks. And then I can see uh, that are arranged uh, in the hub and spoke model. ECMO should be centered to the high volume center hub. You find us performing at least 15 respiratory out of 20 plus uh, treatments per year at, at, at the center and mobile ECMO retrieval services is preferred to be integrated with a high volume center, but it could be a separate two, of course. And concerning the transports, those are very complex and uh, they can be performed, that feasibility has already been shown uh, in a safe manner too, uh, but it's also um, performed by skilled, well-trained uh, personnel that's experienced, that have done this before. They have to stay alert and they have to know their equipment. Uh, High-risk situations are inevitable and they will have to be dealt with immediately, sometimes within seconds. Awareness around this is very important. And it also further emphasizes the demand for highly skilled and trained personnel and for the transports to be organized uh, accordingly. Uh, here are two slides. Uh, that's just Stockholm uh, papers. Uh, and here is uh, a few papers that, that uh, tell you a lot about transport, uh, not so much about problems, but, but uh, uh, what people have done. Uh, the three last here, th those are the papers talking about uh, center volume to outcome, uh, and those are good to, to have read at least once. Um, yeah, I hope I gave you something. Thanks. Well, Mick, thank you so much for your uh, great presentation that um, I think uh, gave us a very good insight of how things work over there with you. So uh, we are currently receiving a lot of questions from our participants and I encourage you to, to keep on asking your questions while we have the discussion. So the, the first couple of questions that I would have uh, from our participants is about when you get the call. Now, I understand you have a 24 seven retrieval service. Do yes. you have like a, a, a dedicated uh, on-call team that will 
um, so to say, only be there to go for retrieval or will they be a part of the general team and then leave the hospital? And, but they still have duties to fulfill whilst they're in the hospital. Uh, depends on time of season. Uh, we have always a physician that's on call for transport. He might be working daytime uh, in the ward. And if it's transport, he leaves. And then somebody could cover him if there's a lot of patients in the ward. We always have a nurse, an ECMO specialist that's sort of on call for this. She's during office hours in the ward. She is an extra resource if we have to go for a CT scan, if we have to go for, for surgery uh, or anything. Uh, if she has nothing to do, she will uh, cut new systems. She will see to that uh, everything is maintained con concerning uh, uh, pumps in ward or transport pumps, etc. cetera. Uh, yeah. Okay. And I understand you always have a surgeon with you who does the cannulation. Is that Correct. right? Okay. Correct. And how will they, will they only do percutaneous or will they also do semi-cut down for cannulation? We, we sort of are born from, from uh, pediatric intensive care and the surgeons, uh, and already from start, it was neonatals and all cannulations were cut down. T today, uh, it could be cut down it could be a CME Seldinger, that is that, that you, you do it uh, percutaneously, but you have opened the skin so you see the vessel where you do the puncture, the venotomy or arteri arteriotomy, or it could be pure Seldinger percutaneous technique. So all three of them. Arterial okay. cannula are more, more prone to be put in uh, under direct uh, uh, vision, of course. Okay. Now, uh, I understand you do the priming in the hospital where you cannulate the patient. Is right, that right? Okay, as far as I see right now, Mick, are you there? Yeah. Yeah, uh, you, you've been lost for just a second. Now, you do the priming of the ECMO circuit on site where you do the cannulation, is that true? Correct. So, so when, when uh, we have decided bedside that the patient is going to uh, be supported with ECMO, that, then I tell my ECMO specialist, specialist that she can start priming. If it's a kid, there's already blood at hand. If it's an adult patient or older kid, then it will be do uh, saline primed. But she will do that uh, whilst uh, I tend to, to the patient or, or other stuff surrounding that. Okay. Um, I have more of a general question. There's also a bunch of detailed questions, but just a general question. You said that the uh, retrieval program in, at Karolinska was established in 1995, but the first transport you did was in 1996. Yeah. Which, which were like the steps that you took in between before you did the first transport and maybe, uh, I mean, you gave a lot of information, but just what would be the basic approach when someone was going to start a retrieval um, system? What, what's the first thing you could do? Uh, in these days, when there, there already are established systems, I would go visit. Uh, what uh, passed in 1995 was that uh, Paula and Christian and, and you know, frankly, they were out uh, downtown running a lamb on ECMO inside an ambulance driving around town. That was one of the uh, procedures they did to, to see that this was feasible. Uh, and then the first transfer uh, was uh, uh, late 1996. Okay, so definitely want to profit from uh, your or other center's experience and go and visit the center to, to learn. That is the best. Don't invent the wheel twice. It, yeah. it will still be round. Okay. Uh, now... You mentioned that you have to check certain things more or less continuously. Do you, uh, in fact, use checklists? We we don't use checklists when on transfer, uh, just tending the patient. But you, you're constantly looking at the patient. You should lift the, the blankets too and see what's underneath, of course. Uh, and we have monitoring on uh, almost as in the ward, but we don't have 
uh, all the sort of pressures. We, we monitor pressures in the circuit too, but we don't have them all online when on transfer. Uh, it's, it's very hard to hear alarms, etc. when you're in the aircraft. It's very, very hard. The checklists are used when we leave the ward, detaching from ward to go for transport. We are introducing or have introduced checklists also when we leave ward with the patient and also when we sort of hand over the patient to another center. Because one of the complications is under the head... Uh, communication and it seems like certain uh, sort of professional groups that they start to move around with our stuff b- before we have had a sort of uh, the SBAR thing in between uh, and uh, yeah we are straight we are straightening things up to, to increase quality okay involving the 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 uh, uh, institution that that's that's going to take over our patient but it's our patient until uh flow blood flow ecmo flow is is established on the uh, receiving hospital's pump till then it's our patient okay so there's there's quite a bunch of questions on on the power supply um you you mentioned the backup system that you use and the internal batteries of the machines. For how many minutes will you be able to run everything without an external uh, power supply? With with the new new batteries in uh, our devices, it's from uh, 30 minutes to four hours uh, that I can recall from the the devices we have. Okay. And um, how, when you're in, the, while you're in the ambulance, um, how do you, how do you, uh, in any way, have to manage or modify the ambulance power? Is that a technical issue, or is that not a problem? The the power in the ambulance. Yes, there was a question yeah. about if you ever have to modify the power that you have available in in the ambulance. Uh, we don't tamper with their electricity, but, but what we we bring plugs that sort of uh, used in that country to which we go. Uh, if we if the ambulance is totally without any any power, then we use the the UPS, of course. Okay. And it 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 happened last year. I think we will had such transport this spring too, where the ambulance that we we were offered had no power at all to support us with. Okay. Do you ever transport patients who have been on um, NO in the in the primary hospital? Yeah, uh, we don't use NO during transfer, so we wean it off, and okay. then uh, when we get back home, so to say, that then we will reinstitute uh, nitric. Uh, probably do a cardiac echo before and, and do do an evaluation of the need of it. Uh, but we we don't transfer on nitric, we don't. But we could use milrinone or something else. Okay. Now there's a like a technical question of one of our participants. Uh, do you uh, use any um, actions of caution whenever you raise the oxygenator about a patient in uh, in VA mode? Does that, in your opinion, raise the risk for certain events like um, air going to the oxygenator, something you have to take care for? Uh, we are aware of the, the relation between oxygenator level to patient's heart. Uh, and all our sort of, uh, on all transports, we always aim and our racks and how, how we, we manage the whole thing. The oxygenator is always significantly below the patient. If they end up in the same level, we will sort of keep the hands there so we see exactly what happens. Okay. And the problem is when uh, loading, reloading in ambulances and aircraft, sometimes you have to lift the whole rack, uh, pump and, and membrane line oxygenator above the patient's level. But, but then you're aware of it and the pump is running, so you have pressures. Uh, but being aware of it is a large step, but I, I, I cannot advise anyone to, to keep it above the patient all the time. 
because uh, then you won't think about it. Okay. Now there was another question if uh, uh, you people who do the transports, uh, you uh, just have the same skills as those colleagues who do the entire ECMO thing uh, at Karolinska itself. There's not a difference. You're all attendings who do that and, and there's no, no such thing like a, a ECMO transport specialist with a special focus, is there? No, no. Uh, all of us, but maybe one or, or two, uh, do the transports. But, but there's a training period. Uh, you should work like uh, maybe one or two years with, with ordinary on-call in the war before you, you are put out to transport. And then you don't go yourself the first time to so go with a senior colleague. It's the same system as with nurses. When they are... Uh, We have now eight transport nurses, eight or nine in that in that system, and those are also trained with a supervisor into this system and and uh, goes on several supervised transfers before they are let alone with with, with the, the, the peculiar physician and the surgeon, of course. Okay. So the security and educational level is prioritized for for patient safety. Okay. Can you uh, like comment on the training that you uh, mentioned on, and maybe uh, do you have a simulation training for for um, getting colleagues ready to do the transports? Uh, we have regular simulations, both uh, simulations of, of uh, ward uh, ECMO runs, and we also have simulations uh, uh, with the ambulance staff and out the, at the airport. We have a special built uh, Lardal mannequin for, for ECMO that we also use in, in uh, some courses we have. Uh, but it's not part of the schooling or training into the uh, to become a transport team member because we don't have that time. And then since we are a pure ECMO ICU, all our patients are, are uh, ECMO patients, I would say. If we have two beds left, we may support the thoracic ICU with an ECMO or non-ECMO patient. We might support the, the pediatric ICU with a non-ECMO patient. Okay. So, so, so uh, uh, is, is ECMO is sort of daily care. That's what we work with. So do you at all offer courses at your place or are you aware of courses that are being offered somewhere else to, to teach people to, uh, to kind of get into that kind of simulation situation or to teach transport associated skills? Uh, I don't know of any of that, that teach transport associated skills. I, I, I just know that, that uh, the course uh, we have in Stockholm for adult respiratory sepsis uh, There's a whole day with simulation with this doll uh, or mannequin, and then there's a whole day with water pump drills. But they're more directed or, or sort of focuses us on what you do in ward. Okay. Now, questions with regard to who would be the best or, or who would be a good candidate for retrieval. I uh, suppose you have like checklists or criteria that you have available for re uh, uh, centers who would like to uh, send you a patient. Uh, well, we, we follow basically the, the ELSO guidelines for ECMO retrieval, uh, for, for uh, ECMO indications. Uh, if there's a patient that is sort of declining rapidly, then the physician there, the patient's physician will sort of tell us that I feel that I'm losing the patient, although criteria might not be fulfilled now, then we will go there anyway, because it's better to be there on, or on the way there before the patient, the patient is in a CPR situation. Okay. What's your uh, experience after all these years, or your, maybe your feelings? Does that increase quality of care in smaller hospitals? I mean, that you go there and you kind of counsel them and uh, certainly you will discuss things with them and they may pick up on your skills, not only associated for ECMO care, but also on how to ventilate a patient properly and what kind of things you can try. Yeah, I, I would say that, I don't say that we are better than anybody else, but, but we sort of, we get all this input from all these calls coming in and most of them, most of the patient-related calls 
will actually not end up in an ECMO transport or an ECMO treatment. So I think that we are sort of a good bounce, uh, a good plank, is that the correct word, a fence or wall to bounce ideas with. And then, then we, we are sort of very keen on remi- reminding that you can't do anything with an infection unless you treat with, with antibiotics. So you should give the correct amount uh, and correct pharmaceutical, the correct agent, and also the, the dose is very important in, in relation to the clearance you have and the increased distribution volume in a septic patient. You may have to give twice the amount of what you read in your pharmacopoeia or, or sometimes even more to get up in, in uh, therapeutic uh, plasma levels. But you won't know that uh, until you actually measure your antibiotics. Okay. And there's, um, we're getting to the last questions. Um, whenever you do international transfers, uh, certainly there will be some credential work in terms of paperwork and all the official things that may be necessary. Is that something that you have to take care of or do you have support with that? Uh, inside the EU, there are seldom any problems. It could be passing customs. They, they will strip you of your, all your tools and knives you have in your own pockets. Uh, but then if uh, we have turned down transport costs, uh, it has not been totally safe to, to go there concerning what you can do as a physician in another country, for example. And uh, we were on our way to one country once and then... Uh, the embassy was involved and stuff. But if the patient is very sick, then you have to try to get hold of that national network. Maybe they can put them on. And then you retrieve the patient and bring them to your your unit or whatever unit that's supposed to, to treat them. Okay. Now, uh, when you have a patient on respiratory ECMO, are there certain standardized uh, ventilator settings that you're looking for during transport? Uh, we will uh, go down in uh, driving pressure. Uh, so the, the peak pressure, we always go pressure control. That's important. We, we don't use volume control at all in Sweden, I would say. Uh, we decrease PEEP and we decrease the dri- driving pressure. And that's our sort of way to, to be uh, gentle to the lungs. Uh, I cannot say that we have increased PEEP even once, but we don't t- shut down the lung. We try to keep tidal volumes during transfer because that's only rescue if, if something uh, nasty happens to the ECMO circuit. Okay. Now, even on long-term uh, um, flights, you never have a second ECMO with you just in case equipment failure occurs? We always bring an extra pump console. We always bring an extra pump motor. We always bring extra oxygenator and pump. And we also uh, bring extra uh, rotor flow pump head and the hand uh, cranking device. So, so we have quite a lot of pump power with us, so to say. So okay. never go for transport without a complete backup, even okay. a circuit or parts that you can build a circuit on, on out in the woods. We bring that. Can you do blood gas analysis during transport? Yeah, we use the eyes that. Okay. We have the different colleges for that. It won't work in the cold, so then you have to keep the, the, the hand unit inside your, your jacket. And you may have to w- warm the, the, the cartridges too, but, but um, it works. And you can uh, actually measure ACTs too. Okay. Now, you can do the ACTs. That, that's the thing you can do with respect to anticoagulation. Okay. Yeah. Do you carry any um, coagulation products with you during uh, f- uh, transport? Uh, now you got me. Uh, we, we had a lot of pharmaceuticals with us t- till just this spring. Then, w- then we sort of uh, made the, the bag less huge. Uh, 
so it's more like like what a woman has when she goes for a stroll. Sorry. Uh, but we always have plasma, so that correlation factors. I can't, I can't tell if we still have fibrinogen with us. I don't know that. Okay, so there's two last questions. So uh, uh, one very detailed question on the ISTAT: If it's true um, that it does not correctly measure troponins at altitude, is that something you uh, have ever heard of? Uh, haven't heard of it, and we don't measure troponins at all with ISTAT. Okay, and the last question, I'm not quite sure if I understand it, but it's coming in repeatedly, so it seems to be important. When you go with a, with a uh, like, um, rotor airplane, like a helicopter, um, what kind of airframes do you use? Are there any specific requirements? What, what kind of um, helicopters you you have to use in order to make it uh, currently uh, we are, since we are so heavy uh, and we need space around the patient uh, we we don't do, go by helicopter because the ones that are accessible to us now they are too small uh, and uh, what we could use is, is the uh, black hawk but we have to, to implant that in the organization first. And then we have to, to also uh, get our racks and patient stretcher, uh, um, um, what's called, approved for helicopter transport. Because you have to be able to withstand 20 Gs in vertical force. And uh, our new stretcher, that's currently under development won't won't handle that. It will do like six to eight Gs. Okay, Mick, thank you so much for making yourself available and for sharing your great experience uh, with all of our participants. It's been uh, well above 100 throughout the entire time. That's a great number. Thank mm -hmm. you so much thank again. You. Uh, thank you to all of our participants for uh, being with us. Um, if you got in late, don't worry, you will be able to download it um, on the URLs website in soon. And um, for now, please make sure that your venous cannula is blueberry and your arterial line is cherry berry. Thank you so much for being with the URLs webinar series and have a great day. Bye bye.